What's up all you mentees, Uncanny Omar here from Nearman Condition and join me today for a look at these trade paperbacks coming out from Marvel Comics this week, so stay tuned. Welcome back everybody, before getting started, a huge thank you to David Gabriel and the fine folks at Marvel for sending us advanced copies of these graphic novels, trade paperbacks, collected editions that all come out this week. Uh, either January 18th or 19th, depending on where you get your books. So just as a reminder, I always put timestamps in the description of the video so you can jump around. Uh, for example, I'm going to be talking about The Amazing Spider-Man Beyond Volume 1. And I have to mention a spoiler. But the spoiler is already in the back in the description of the book. So it's not much of one. But just in case you go, want to go into these books completely blind, please, by all means, jump around like Criss Cross. No. No, that wasn't Criss Cross. What the heck's wrong with me? That was Cypress Hill. Criss Cross did jump, jump. But anyway, yes, the, the timestamps are in the description of the video. So we have an anthology of Reign of Eggs, an epic collection, and some great trades. Three Spidey trades, or Spider-Man related trades. So let's go ahead and get started. Start with Spider-Woman. You know, I had the book purposely upside down. That was completely done on purpose. False, it was not. <laughs> That just, for some reason, I had it upside down. Maybe because she looks really cool like that. She almost looks like she's powering up like a Super Saiyan. Yeah, that one's on me. This is the way the book uh, is supposed to be. So this is volume three of Carla Pacheco's run on Spider-Woman. Pere Perez joins her on artwork. And then Frank de Armada is the colorist on the book. So you had Jessica deal with a bunch of family issues in the last two arcs. And now she's back with her boyfriend, she's back with her son, things are going normal, and then she meets these two gentlemen right here, Los Espadas Gamelas de Toledo, or as she likes to call it, Toledo, Ohio. So this book does see her back, just fighting a couple of thieves here, but they do have a secret to do with the swords. And they play a role for the first couple of issues that helps set up the next story arc. And the next story arc is about a bunch of mercenaries that are coming to steal something from Jessica Drew. Including a very popular one that goes by the name of Lady Bullseye. She was a uh, creator by uh, Ed Brubaker during his run on Daredevil. And then of course a couple of other mercenaries like Bruiser here. But... What I found interesting about this particular book is, well, it's the revelation as to who hired these mercenaries and why. And it seems like um, Jessica's dealing with a lot of family issues and she's not quite done yet as of this particular uh, collection. So this collects issues 11 through 16 of Spider-Woman. It has 136 pages here. Let's skip a little bit because that last page is a little bit of a spoiler there. And the coolest thing about this that I found is that Jessica gets a new sidekick right here. I love that. I love that she has, well, two sidekicks, even though she doesn't want to give them any sidekick names. She eventually gets two of them. And this is a different type of Jessica Drew than, for example, um, you know, her original series, of course. She's a lot more mature, but she still has that quirky wittiness about her that made her... I hate to say it, but a female version of Spider-Man until she kind of grew into her own. She's definitely a different character than she was in the pages of Chris Claremont's Wolverine or in New Avengers. You know, she's a kid. She's got a, she's a kid. She's got a kid now, and she's got a sidekick. And the way the um, variant covers are collected, you have the main cover here, and then most of the time on the opposite page is one of the variant covers. So... Let's look at the extras. So they, for the extras, censoring that final page, of course, there's really not that many extras because most of these variants are collected on the opposite side of the standard cover. And I do have to say, I really miss that particular outfit. I loved it. I thought it was a great outfit and I wish he had held on to it a little bit more. And speaking of different outfits, here we have Miles Morales, All Eyes on Me. Nice Tupac. Uh, but... This is volume six of the ongoing Saladin Ahmed run, and it's also celebrating the 10th anniversary of Miles Morales. Has it really been 10 years since this character's been around? And it's really cool that Marvel does this, like they tell you where to start reading Miles Morales if you're wanting to get these books in trade paperback format. Here, let's look all the way in the back. 
and then continuing over here until you finally get this book, which is like volume 14. So is there enough material for a third omnibus? And I guess that's part of the reason why the Omnis are being rebranded this year. They're not only being reprinted, but they're coming out with a new title or they're being rebranded with new titles. So Saladin Ahmed returns with Christopher Allen and Carmen Carnero as the two main artists on the book. So this is after the events of the Clone Saga. So Miles Morales went through his own Clone Saga and it explains really quickly what happened and how his costume got destroyed, how he still has a clone out there and his clone is named Shift and he's not quite all there. He's super powerful and has different types of powers than Miles does. Now, one interesting thing about this particular trade paperback is that the solicitations called for this to collect Spider-Man or Miles Morales Spider-Man 29 through 31 as well as material from annual number one. But this collects issues 29 through 32 instead. It has 112 pages and retails for $15.99. So Miles is getting bullied. He sees Shift in the sewers. He's like, oh, there you are, Shift. And he introduces his best friend, Genki, to Shift. And of course, this is where he gets his new costume. See what I mean? I thought, like, the solicits, or I'm sorry, the, like, preliminary artwork showed that it was pink, but it's a red costume. Not sure how I feel about it. I really like that second costume when he came over to the 616 universe. His own costume that he's had for a long time. But... This is kind of like a mix between, I don't know, the Scarlet Spider. It's, a, it's it, I, I'm not digging the jacket is what I'm not digging, really. It looks pretty cool in action shots and, and stuff, but just not the biggest fan of that outfit. Now, he ends up going on a date with Starling. And, of course, Starling has relations to a Spider-Man villain. But, of course, that's all ruined by the character of Taskmaster, who ends up taking Starling with him. So the covers are collected like this with the issue number up up top. And this leads into the Spider-Man Beyond comic because this has a big cliffhanger um, that is a pretty interesting cliffhanger. It's a, what you think is a group of men in black with sunglasses coming in and about to take out Miles Morales. Not for dinner, but take him out. Um, well, there's a little bit of a twist as to why they're approaching him. You can find out exactly why, because this ties into the Beyond event. Now, here we have a collection of stories from uh, the people that wrote the Spider-Verse movie, as well as Sarah Pakelli providing some of the artwork in here. Let's fast forward a little bit. There's another little story. Maybe this is the material from Annual Number 1, but I still never states that it's Annual Number 1 material. And then, of course, we have some 10th Anniversary covers here variant covers and then the design variants right there by chase conley it's pretty cool so that does look pink as opposed to the way that it finally looks that's what i thought okay let me see kind of dig that one that one's cool what are how many oh okay now looking at it i kind of dig that maybe it looks really good in black and white Still not digging that jacket. I don't know. Maybe that's what the kids are into these days. And then the process of the covers there. Now comes a brand new era of the Amazing Spider-Man Beyond Volume 1. So, Volume 1. It gets a little bit confusing because this is immediately taking place right after Nick Spencer's run. So this collects issues 75 through 80 and 78 Bay. I call it Bay, but it's really 78 Beyond. So Amazing Spider-Man, the Beyond Corporation, has hired their own Spider-Man. This, of course, is the cool thing about it. And that is the brain trust that comes up with these stories for the Beyond era. So you have Amazing Spider-Man 75 through 76, written by Zeb Wells, drawn by Patrick Gleason. Uh, 77 through 78 is written by Kelly Thompson and Sarah Pichelli, drawn the artwork. However, there's also these little short story arcs in here. Like, you have some more Zeb Wells stories in here about Janine. And, well, since we last saw her, she was still behind bars. Kafka, Love and Monsters. Uh, Cody Ziegler writing Amazing Spider-Man 79 through 80. 78 Bay or Beyond is written by Jed McKay, who's killing it in Black uh, Cat. 
And then the covers are mainly provided by Arthur Adams. So we kick it off with Amazing Spider-Man 75. Again, taking place after the events of uh, Nick Spencer's run. And something horrible has happened in the life of Peter Parker. He's lost someone really dear to him. Again. And he's just going out swinging. And he runs into this other Spider-Man that's just chilling out. And <laughs> the other Spider-Man ends up telling him to shh. Now again... I am going to be talking about spoilers, so just in case you don't want to know anything about this, by all means, please skip around, go to the next book, which I think is Reign of X. Um, so, the other Spider-Man turns out to be the clone, the Ben Riley. So, Ben Riley has returned, and he wants to sit down and talk to Peter Parker. I thought this conversation was really cool. This, again, drawn by Patrick Gleason. They're having kind of a heart-to-heart -heart moment, and then... Ben Riley just flat out says, look, I've been hired by the Beyond Corporation to be Spider-Man. And he's like, so you're asking me to share Spider-Man with you? Like, you want to be Spider-Man at the same time that I'm Spider-Man? He's like, no, I'm not asking. I'm actually telling you I've already accepted. And I was like, damn, Ben Riley, you're going to... That's pretty cool. You're being your own man. Way to go. I dig that. I dig that. So Ben Riley is his own man. He's starting to work for the Beyond Corporation. He has all these little gimmicks and tools. And there's his girl, Janine, who, like I said, is now out of prison. Maybe it was some deal that he worked with the Beyond Corporation. Maybe not. So what ends up happening is that Peter Parker gets taken out of commission. Now, I don't know if he's dead or not. You can find out for yourself exactly what happens. And then Ben Riley becomes the one and only Spider-Man. Of course, this is all temporary. If you've read enough comics, you know that Ben Riley is not going to stick around being the one and only Spider-Man. You know that eventually Peter Parker will be back. Uh, but we get to read about Ben Riley again. He's a different type of Spider-Man. He's being trained by the Daughters of the Dragon. So you have some Colleen Wig action here. And you have some Misty Knight action in here. As well as Monica Rambeau. She comes in here. Uh, he gets to fight Morbius and Craven the Hunter. You get great artwork in here from Sarah Pichelli. Even though I really miss her ultimate days of artwork, I loved her artwork during that time. This is still good. And again, the way they're doing some of the variants, they're collected on the opposite side of the main covers. So this is another one of those Patrick Gleason web covers that he's been just known for lately. And there's Monica right there. So here's the story with Craven. So it's good to see him fight classic villains. It's good to see him just team up or getting trained by the Daughters of the Dragon. And it's nice to read about Ben Riley again. And I think this is why a lot of people thought, hey, do you think there's any chance that the Clone Saga Omnibus are going to be reprinted? Uh, I mean, I haven't seen a, those in the reprint list, but perhaps one day. I never thought... Like I've mentioned this before, that I see the day where people are demanding a reprint of the Clone Saga. That is really cool. That is really a big difference in the times that we are in. I love it. Here's some more of the action sequences, and let's get to the back to look at the extras. So here's some of the variants. The book has 216 pages and retails for $24.99. There's the classic Scarlet Spider outfit. Now, do you get to see that outfit in here? Yeah, there's a small little cameo in here. Uh, the Daughters of the Dragon right there. The Rob Liefeld uh, 30th anniversary of Deadpool. Craven the Hunter. Who did that one? Sergio da Vila. It's an awesome Craven the Hunter. Jurgens. Jurgens, who ended up uh, drawing and writing Sensational Spider-Man, thinking he was going to be writing and drawing about Peter Parker, but ended up getting Ben Riley. With that outfit right there. And then the these are the Masterpiece variants. Hey, I just did a video on the Joe Jusco Masterpiece hardcover. All right, all you Spine Watchers, here's what all the spines look like for the books coming out this week. And just a small reminder, smile reminder, Uncanny Omar Talk Pretty One Day. Small reminder, please don't forget to hit that like button. All right. Reign of X, Volume 8. You have this awesome Nimrod cover. Here is the back, collecting cable number 10, Children of the Atom number 3, Excalibur 20, X-Men 20, and Hellions 9 and 10. So that is what's collected in this particular collection here. Kicking it off with cable 
number 10. Now, cable number 10 is towards the end of Young Cable's run, so I can't spoil much. So I'm just going to actually just go through here pretty quick to show off some of this Phil Noto artwork. Uh, the big thing about this is that there's a revelation that Young Cable wants to revive a mutant, and Cyclops is like, hell no, we're not going to revive that character. He had his time, and I thought that was a pretty interesting take and where the story might go by the time it ends with issue number 12. Now, of course, we've got two trade paperbacks of Cable. It can be collected that way. Uh, or the hardcover that's coming out, collecting the entire series. I am going to miss this character because this was a lot of fun. Surprisingly, I really enjoyed this particular story of him just saving a bunch of mutant babies. Uh, the next story in here is Excalibur. I was wrong. It's Children of the Atom number three. And Bernard Chang supplying the artwork, which I thought was the best thing about this particular story. I've read all five issues. Uh, this is written by Vida Ayala and features these characters here of Cherub, Marvel Guys, Cyclops Last, Gimmick, and Daycrawler. Now, there was a twist to this particular story of them, um, why they decided to stay behind and not go to Krakoa. But that's not revealed until issue number four. And like I said, I'm not really going to spoil anything for anybody. But this is what the artwork looks like. I love this anthology series because you get to try out so many of the books that you normally wouldn't. Like if you were getting just the trade paperbacks of each series. More than likely some people wouldn't get Children of the Atom. More than likely people would skip out on uh, Cable. And I think it's a really cool idea. And I really wish they would do more collections like this. Like if Spider-Man ever goes into this Spider-Man era of a huge brain trust and having 12 different Spider-Man titles like it was in the 90s for a while. I would love them for uh, to collect them like this particular book. So here we have Excalibur. This is the story of Betsy Braddock that's gone missing. She's Captain Britain during this time, but it's also the return of a character uh, that played an important role during the Mutant Massacre. And how these characters from Excalibur are just reacting to this particular character coming back because she was such a pain in the ass to a lot of people, uh, not just in the 80s, but also in the 90s, especially uh, Polaris. Then we have this really awesome story about uh, Mystique in X-Men number 20. And Professor X and Magneto have asked her to go and pretty much stop the creation of Nimrod. Stop Dr. Uh, Gregor from creating Nimrod because they know how it's they know how it's going to pan out. And she says, OK, but she has a stipulation. She says, I will do it if you do this for me. And they're like, yeah, sure. But it doesn't happen. So what are the ramifications of that? I thought that was pretty interesting uh, the way that was handled and probably leading into because I've all read the first two issues of Inferno. I'm pretty sure it leads into a little bit of that. Then we have Hellions. Oh my gosh, I'm so going to miss this title. This was my just breakout series of the Dawn of X era. I'm glad they got into the Reign of X. And sadly, it wraps up uh, with issue number 18 being the final one. So we have the characters of Havoc, Orphan Maker, Grey Crow, um, Quanon, and Empath. Oh, Nanny. I love Nanny. I'm so going to miss Nanny. And of course, all being led by Sinister and uh, Wild Child. So, <laughs> they get put... Oh, I'm so glad to see Sage back, too. Sage was one of the best parts about Extreme X-Men. So, they're thrown into a game, of course. Mr. Sinister gets betrayed by Mastermind. And they get thrown into a game of Arcade. Arcade is one of these characters that is hit and miss with me. Sometimes I enjoy his stories that he's in, and then sometimes it's a little bit too much. I thought one of the freakiest uses of him was in the uh, Gambit and Wolverine miniseries. Uh, the, the story written by Jeff Loeb and drawn by Tim Sell. Just the way that Tim Sell portrayed him. Of course, there's Miss Locke, and there's Sinister, and then he's just having fun with the Hellions. So that's practically what this two-issue story arc that's collected in the back is about. Now, as far as the extras, there's not that many. Censoring that final page of Hellions number 10. Yeah, but here is a variant cover by Bernard Chang. And I love that variant cover by Mike Del Mundo. Uh, this book retails for $17.99 and it has... 160 pages. Last but certainly not least, Hawkeye. Clint Barton finally gets his own epic collection. 
And I say finally, I really didn't mean finally because there's not a lot of characters that have their own epic collections, um, you know, that are outside of the main core group of the Avengers. I guess from the movies, we have Captain America, we have Hulk with his own epic run, Thor, Iron Man, but they had their own magazines before they formed the Avengers. But we did have Black Widow because of the movie, and I guess because of the TV show, we now have Hawkeye. So, this was a series that, I don't know, I wasn't at, in, interested at all at first, because I was like, I've read a lot of this stuff in the Avengers Omnis, or in the Epic Collections when I had those. So, you know, I've read his first appearance in the pages of Iron Man, so it does kick off with Tales of Suspense number 57. And this introduces the character of Hawkeye. So let's talk about that first. Let's talk about the uh, what this collects. So this does collect material from Tales of Suspense 57 and 60 and 64. Marvel Tales 100. These are all material from Marvel Fanfare 3 and 39. And Marvel Super Action number 1. And then it collects the Hawkeye miniseries from 1983. The very first Hawkeye miniseries. Four issues, Avengers 16, 63 to 65, 189 and 223, Marvel Team Up 22 and 92 and 95, Captain America 317. So those are the full issues that it collects in here. So yes, he first starts off as a villain, and then eventually, because of something that happens to Black Widow, this by the way is all drawn by Don Heck, um, in the pages of the Avengers, he decides to become one of the good guys and of course that is avengers number 16 that's the big like famous issue for captain america forming his own lineup of avengers it's the first time that the avengers you know they'd had a rotating cast but it's the first time that most of them walked away and they left captain america alone starts off with this fight with the masters of evil who's got the melter at the time the black knight the executioner and enchantress and then hawkeye comes in going look i want to be a good guy and then they get a letter from Quicksilver and Scarlet Witch going, Hey, look, we are interested in joining the Avengers because uh, Magneto is kind of a jerk. So, I mean, I wish I was kidding. That's kind of what they do. They write a letter. So the Avengers decide to end up leaving. And here we go. Avengers Assemble. This is the new lineup. And then we get the story here of uh, when he becomes Goliath for the first time with beautiful artwork by Gene Colan. Man, that guy could draw some dynamic fighting um, panels, I, I, I wasn't appreciative of his artwork when I was younger. It wasn't until I was in my 30s that I learned to just appreciate his art so much, uh, mainly because of Tomb of Dracula. But yes, this is the first time that they're going to go and rescue Black Widow. They want Clint to sit out of it, or Hawkeye to sit out of it. So of course, the loophole is Clint's like, okay, sure. She's not going to be rescued by this Robin Hood type of character. She's going to be rescued by a talking giant. So he takes some of Hank's formula and becomes Goliath. And that's why you see him sometimes be in the Goliath costume and sometimes he's Hawkeye. But this leads into another uh, f story that features him. Uh, it's, a, it's about a family reunion. Uh, we get to see a little bit of his origin with the swordsman. And that's all kind of recapped in the first miniseries, I want to say, of Hawkeye. Then we get the Marvel team up. So we start seeing more and more little solo stories featuring Clint Barton. We start seeing him just kind of grow bigger than his Avengers role. And there's part of the Marvel Tales, and here's the John Byrne era of Avengers, where he gets to fight Deathbird, I believe. Yeah, right here. Which... I thought this was funny because at first he thought it was Falcon. So you get some awesome John Byrne artwork in here. There's Henry Geirich. You have the team up with Spider-Man again against Fear. And this is the one with El Aguila. Yeah. Where you kind of see him use a little bit of his uh, sword techniques. This is from Marvel Fanfare. And let's see. Where is? Yeah, right here. So here we have an early appearance of Bobby. And this, of course, will, she's going to become Mockingbird. So this is um, all from Marvel Super Action number one. Now, she had appeared before in the pages of Kazar, and she was kind of a love interest. But in this, she appears as a almost like a secret agent known as the Huntress. So she's gone past the point of being Agent 19 or a love interest for Kazar. 
And you get to see her in this just like a solo story. It's a black and white story, and she's known as the Huntress in this. But the next time she appears in the Marvel Universe, the 616 Universe, she is now known as Mockingbird. And I, I like that. I'm glad that they decided to go with Mockingbird instead of Huntress. That would get a little too confusing with the Distinguished Competition character, whom I love. But when she teams up with Spider-Man... In this particular issue, she is known as Mockingbird. Now, it was Mark Grunewald that wanted to use her for a love interest for Clint Barton. And that leads into this book right here, Hawkeye. Because at first, she was designed to be a villain for Spider-Woman. And you could kind of tell that uh, reading these early issues. But here is Hawkeye. Here is where he's finally fallen in love with this girl named Sheila. He's like, man, I've got my life balanced. You know, I've got this... Hi, this this awesome flying sled that they've made better because it can now fly higher. I'm a superhero. I get paid lots of money, and I finally have somebody that reciprocates my love. Because he has a flashback of Scarlet Witch and Black Widow, of course. However, he gets his heart broken in this poor Clint. He can never win. He starts crying about something that Sheila does, and it just it can't be fixed because she betrays him and. One of the worst ways you can betray somebody. Of course, now we have Mockingbird here. She's introduced to Clint through these pages. And together they go on an adventure. Uh, they fight uh, crime together, including these two characters right here. Bombshell and Oddball that are hired by... What was his name? Cross-Eyed? Not Cross-Eyed, that's a ridiculous name. This guy right here, Crossfire. And together they fall in love, and that's what this miniseries is about. Now, this miniseries is not collected in the pages of the Avengers West Coast. Um, then we have this team up here, Hawkeye training Captain America on how to use a bow and arrow. Another Mark Grunewald story. And then the story from Marvel Tales right here by J.M. DeMatteis and Joe Staten. It's got some great artwork. Now, as far as the extras... So we have Marvel Triple Action number 10, which reprinted Avengers number 16. But they have a brand new cover by Gil Kane. You have an article here from 1983 from Marvel Age number 6, talking about the limited series of Hawkeye. That's written by Mark Grunewald. An ad for the Hawkeye miniseries. This old-ass trade paperback I used to have. When did this come out? It had to have been the... Yeah, 1988. I remember this trade paperback because that was the way that I read it. Uh, the Hawkeye Introduction by Mark Grunewald. Archie Goodwin um, introducing the Marvel Super Action number one. Marvel Team Up Letters page afterward by Mark Grunewald. Talking about the character of Mockingbird and how he wanted to utilize her. Official handbook guide of the Marvel, or the handbook of the Marvel Universe profiles there. The book retails for $39.99. There's the Mockingbird picture right there. And it has 432 pages. So, it's Barbara, Bobby Morse. You know, I don't think I've ever heard, or I've never called her Barbara. I've only called her Bobby. And here's all these other <laughs> villains that played a part in Hawkeye. The covers to the Marvel premiere. And then, of course, the Epic Collection. And that, as they say, is that. If you're interested in any of these books, don't forget to check out our sponsor. CheapGraphicNovels.com, your online home for brand new graphic novels and collected editions up to 50% off cover price. They pride themselves on packaging your books so they arrive safely in an excellent condition as well as prompt and helpful service. Check out the bargain deals for up to 90% off cover price. CGN is excited to announce that they are now taking pre-orders. They're making it easier for you to ensure that you don't miss out on the hottest releases. CGN is currently running a special promotion for your mentees. If you're a first-time customer, let them know that you were referred by near mint condition at the checkout and you'll receive a credit for free shipping on your next order. This promotion is valid for U.S. customers only. Cheap Graphic Novels, your source for the hottest books with a kind of deep discount and quality shipping and customer service that will keep you coming back for more. And that was the content and page count of each of these trades. Let me know in the comments down below which trades you're picking up this week. If you're a fan of the Epic line, if you're excited about Hawkeye because he's your favorite Avenger and he's finally getting his own Epic, or if you're just going to stick to the Avengers Epic. Uh, if you're reading Spider-Man in this particular manner, if you're reading it in trade paperback format, what you thought about the Beyond series, or, or if you're reading it monthly, are you excited for the new ongoing series? And please tell me I'm not the only one enjoying Spider-Woman. That book is phenomenal. Again, this was The Uncanny Omar. Thank you all so much for watching. Don't forget to smash that like button. Ring that bell for notifications. That lets you know when our videos are going live. 
We are on Spreadshop and on Patreon. Amazing ways to support the channel if you can do so. And thank you to our existing patrons. And more importantly, everyone, stay healthy, stay safe, much love.